Good afternoon. Um, this lecture is on banking and the business cycle. And it follows up on, on, on the lecture this morning about money and prices. One thing I did want to point out uh, this morning when we talked about uh, the real money supply and hyperinflation, under hyperinflation, at the end of a hyperinflation, of course, the, um, the, the real value of the money supply, the real money supply, despite all the trillions of, of marks that were in circulation, was effectively zero because at, at that point, you, no matter how many marks you brought, you couldn't buy an egg with them. Okay? So one thing that hyperinflation does is actually to reduce the real money supply towards zero as the, the nominal money supply increases towards infinity. Okay. So, so the government can always destroy the value of the real money supply, but it really can't increase it. Okay, so let's get to um, banking uh, as a lead-in to the uh, Austrian theory of the business cycle. Okay. Um, I want to distinguish between two forms of banking right off the bat, and that is uh, what uh, is sometimes called loan banking and deposit banking. And what we have today is a hybrid of the two. In order, to, in order to analyze banking, what we need is what's called a, a T account or a balance sheet. Okay, um, it's basically double bookkeeping, double entry bookkeeping. And that's really come down from Renaissance Italy and um, f even further back from uh, uh, Arab North Africa. But um, basically, uh, in a T account or a balance sheet, what we have is on the right side is the amount of the various assets contributed by various individuals. Okay. Um, that is either equity owners or, or um, bondholders. And on the left side, we have the total assets of, of the business firm and uh, what they are invested in. So um, let's start with a simple example that Murray Rothbard has used to illustrate loan banking. Okay, now loan banking, as we'll see, is non-inflationary. Okay. If someone wants to start a, a bank, they take $10,000 of their own funds, and that appears on the right side as uh, equity. And um, immediately then, they have assets on the left side of, of, of $10,000. Okay. Now, what they've done is, is, is they've, taken, they've diverted uh, cash from other uses and have began, begun this bank. So there's been no addition to the money supply. That's, that's a key point. Okay. Once that loan has, once that bank has been started, begins operations. Okay. Uh, a loan is made, let's say, um, for, for $9,000 in exchange of present money. Um, let's say uh, there's a 10% interest rate. So the loan is made from, from the Rothbard Bank to uh, an individual named Joe. Okay. Um, and $1,000 of cash is kept on hand as part of the assets. Once again, there has not been any increase in the money supply. There has been a transfer of money from Rothbard's cash balance to Joe's cash balance. Okay, so money has changed hands, but it has not increased. Okay, that's an important point. Um, now, this loan bank can certainly um, issue stock and, 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 and broaden its, or increase its, its equity. But um, l let me mention that when the loan is paid back, the $9,900, um, the, the $9, that is $9,000 in principal, $900 in interest, again, the money supply changes hands, is transferred from one cash balance to the other, but there is no change in its total amount. Now, if this bank, quote, goes public, this equity bank, it issues stocks, and you have then on the right side equity owned by shareholders, and let's say the bank expands to $100,000 of um, equity. And then, again, loans are made. $95,000 of, of, of that equity is transferred to um, borrowers. And those borrowers then spend the money. That money is not available then to the shareholders okay, until it is returned at the end of the term of the loan. Okay. Once again, the bank going public does not change the fact that loan banking cannot increase or change in any way the money supply. 
The bank may further expand by issuing bonds, okay, that is debt, okay, bonds and certificates of deposit. Uh, CDs are more or less short-term debt, bonds are longer-term debt, and so they get an additional $70,000 of, um, of assets, okay, so that the bank's um, assets on the left side increases, and on the right side they now have liabilities, debts they owe to other um, owners who have contributed cash to, to the business. Okay. Once again, the issuing of debt, the sale of bonds and certificates of deposit in exchange for, for cash has no effect on the money supply. Of course, they're not going to keep that $70,000 lying um, uh, unused um, in the bank's vaults, but they will lend that out. So, so, so the amount of, of loans they make will now increase. Okay. So you see on the, on, on the right side is $170,000 uh, in total of um, equity and liabilities and $170,000 of assets. Not one penny increase in the money supply has occurred as a result of these um, loan banking operations. So basically, um, let's sum up about loan banking. Uh, bank lending, okay, even the lending of borrowed funds at $70,000, does not involve the creation of M. Okay? It's not inherent in, 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 uh, in a financial intermediary. Because what the bank is doing here, when it borrows at $70,000 and loans it to another set of, of borrowers, the bank is acting as a financial intermediary, okay? bringing together ultimate lenders with borrowers of funds, okay? Um, it also cha ch channels savings um, out of, of, of uh, or uh, into um, productive loans and investments, okay? So it increases the efficiency of the economy. Um, if it makes unsound loans, okay, if some of those $165,000 worth of IOUs are not repaid, the bank's creditors and the bank's uh, shareholders suffer. Okay, there is no effect on, on, on the total amount of money in the economy. Now let's go move on to deposit banking. Okay, that is pure deposit banking, not the hybrid form that we have today. And uh, deposit banking arose, uh, at least in the English-speaking world, um, uh, in the 16th century. Um, when goldsmiths began to rent out their, their vaults, their safes, uh, their deposit boxes for the safekeeping of gold and silver um, that, that people uh, brought to them. Basically, what a depositor in a warehouse does, okay, under deposit banking, is to put on, put on deposit or in trust, okay, um, some form of property, wheat, furniture, clothing, furs, or money, okay? In exchange, the depositor receives a warehouse receipt, okay, which entitles them to come in and claim the property, their property, at any moment uh, in time, okay? That is on demand. Um, so they can redeem it instantaneously. Now, there's a difference between depositing money in a warehouse and depositing things like furniture or, or wheat or corn or whatever it is, because the wheat or corn, people are interested in getting, or rather, uh, let's, let's keep away from wheat and corn for a moment, let's talk about furniture. People are interested in getting back, okay, the deposit are interested in getting back their specific um, items of property, okay, when it comes to, to things like furniture. But when it comes to, to, to uh, something like money, they're not interested in getting back the exact same units, they're interested in getting back the same weight of money, okay. And secondly, um, when you, with other commodities, they tend to be used. So eventually, they're going to be withdrawn, okay? So even if it is wheat or um, it's furniture, eventually that will be removed from the warehouse at some point in time. However, money can perform its job as a medium of exchange by remaining on deposit and having the 